So what a pleasure it is to be with you this morning. I'm so glad you found that grey-headed bushrike. It's a special bird to see. You don't often get to see one of those. You always hear them, hence the Afrikaans name the Spookful, which means a ghost bird. So we are on our way now to go look for some lions. Apparently lions were hunting buffalo around the Juma area and I am super excited to try and find them. I actually have goosebumps at this stage. I'm a little bit nervous. This is my first time doing a, a game drive with Safari Live. If you have any questions, please remember to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and also questions at wildearth.tv. I want to hear everything you have to ask and uh, please, we'll see what we can find. So it has rained a little bit last night. We are quite excited. It hasn't rained in quite a few months, as you might all know. The smell in the air is somewhat unusual as the spores get released from the soils as soon as moisture hits. And it's just a sign of refreshness and joy amongst uh, the animals and trees and birds this morning. So Jamie's going to be telling me where to go this morning, so please just bear with me. We are on uh, a new reserve, or I'm on a new reserve. You met Taylor last night, who gave you a splendid game drive, I believe. So I hope I can live up to your expectations. What a joy. So as we're driving, we are looking for some lion tracks, which I hope we'll get to find pretty soon. The, the older tracks have been washed away by the fresh rain, so if we do pick up on any, any lion tracks, I will be sure to stop and let you know. So, what do you want to see this morning? Let me know, please. I'd love to have some feedback. I know for some of you it's early morning, late afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. But uh, over here right now, it's about 15 degrees, 61 Fahrenheit. Beautiful morning, overcast. We might get a bit of rain this afternoon, which uh, we desperately need. I don't think we're going to get too much though as uh, this cold front passes over South Africa. Well thank you very much everybody watching, I really appreciate the warm welcome. It's fantastic to be here and what a privilege it is to share this magic moment with you. Game drives for me are just incredible. and. I think one of the most important things is that we get to show you all aspects of the bush. Not just the big and hairies, but also the small fauna and flora that uh, allow the big and hairies to survive. The, the bush is so amazing and without the, the soil we wouldn't get certain tree species, without the tree species we wouldn't get certain antelope species, and without those antelope we wouldn't get certain predators. And we are on the Sabi sands which is part of the Greater Kruger National Park, which extends 65,000 hectares in acres. That's probably about 130,000 acres, which is part of a, an area that's about 7 to 8 million acres in size with absolutely no fences. So animals roam freely on a daily basis, and we get to see them all the time. But it's not like a zoo. We have to really go look for them. and. We're going to try. We're going to try to show you what we can find and hopefully come across some cool things. So as we approach this drainage line, le leopards love drainage lines. Good morning Donna. Donna wants to know where I'm from and what's my favorite animal in the bush. Donna, I grew up in a small town off the east coast of South Africa. Good morning Donna. Donna wants to know where I'm from and what's my favorite animal in the bush. Donna, I grew up in a small town off the east coast of South Africa called Margate. Now that's not the Margate in England near Kent, it's Margate in KwaZulu-Natal. And I went to school in KwaZulu-Natal at a place called Maritzburg College and we're going to be actually hosting a little uh, school this morning called St. Benedict's between half past eight and half past nine. My favorite animal, I enjoy everything about the bush. I'll 
I'll be quite honest with you, I don't enjoy watching lions sleep. It's like watching wet paint dry. But I do enjoy them going around, walking around, roaring, hunting. Any animal that's doing anything exciting, I love to watch. Even a fork-tailed jonger catching a, a little cricket or insect. Maybe an elephant uh, drinking water. There's so much to nature that we don't know about. So Donna, I hope that answered your question. And uh, keep them coming, everybody. I hope you send lots more. So, Jamie, where do you think these lions are going to be? I think they're going to be on the road. Hi, morning. Don't put me on camera, I need to brush my hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope we can find one. Good morning, Jennifer. Jennifer wants to see a tiny baby elephant. Well, Jennifer, yesterday we had an amazing sighting with Taylor and Brent with elephants. And I'm hoping we'll get to see some this morning. It's very important that uh, we get to show you what you want to see. So we're approaching Juma Dam where these lions were yesterday. And uh, we're going to look for these lions. But while we look for these lions, I'm going to hand you over to Brent and uh, see what he has to show you. Enjoy. Okay, so Ryan's right around the Juma waterhole where we saw those tracks earlier. I'm taking a bit of a wider stance to see if they've maybe gone up to the north. So far, good news, no tracks. We don't actually want to find tracks in this area um, because it is quite close to the northern edge of our traverse. But it is actually a beautiful, beautiful morning, even though it's sort of misty. It's going to keep the cameraman busy, but the birds are absolutely loving it this morning. Lots of calling, and uh, we do have the Z150. So while we're looking for lions, I'm definitely going to try put... How many birds do you think we can get on camera today, Dave? 50 species. How's that for a challenge? Oh, Dave's, Dave's, Dave's a bit <gasps> nervous. 50 species. I don't think we've ever done 50 species in a single drive before. So it's a challenge uh, to ourselves. So we've got one, which is the grey-headed bushrike, which is not one we see too often. Hi, Taffy in Washington State. And just one second. Kathy, sorry, um, Jay, uh, just getting a call on the radio, uh, nothing further, um, I'm on the shortcut from the shortcut to Buffalo Zook. I'm going to check Buffalo Zook to the east. Uh, copy, uh, the last tracks I had were actually at the pan, or heading towards the pan, in a northwesterly direction. Sorry about that, Kathy. Uh, now, Kathy is wondering about that incredibly beautiful bird called, nicknamed the ghost bird, or the spook fool. Uh, spook is ghost in Afrikaans, and fool is bird. Uh, and Kathy's wondering, is it a migratory species? Um, does it move? Uh, it isn't, it's a resident species, and she also wants to know if it's resident over most of South Africa. And it is, uh, if I remember correctly, it just misses a few of the sort of true desert spots, but we'll double check that for you right now. Now the bushfike family are incredibly beautiful. The two most common ones we get here Listen to the radio. So there we go. There's their distribution. They stick to the more moist areas. Uh, this is far more arid and dry. And there we go. So, copy, thanks, Orbs. We are about there. So there we go. That's the distribution of the grey headed bushrike. So the two bushrike feces we get here is uh, the grey headed which is the one we saw this morning, and the orange-breasted. Now, one up, there we go, that one there. 
So both of them have grey heads and orange breasts, um, but you can see the orange breast it doesn't quite have the same grey head and it doesn't have that yellow eye stripe or that the grey headed as opposed to orange bushwhack. And the most one of the easy dis distinguishing things it's a much much bigger and also the the yellow eye as opposed to the dark eye. Very very cool. Now hopefully we get to see the orange breasted this morning as well. Uh, we do have other possibilities but I've never seen gorgeous um, or black fronted although it's a slight possibility that they might occur here. Uh, they generally prefer sort of thicker riverine habits um, and I've just heard from Aubrey he's got the tracks of them where the lion started chasing those buffalo and they're heading straight south so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually change my route and I'm going to head up towards Sydney's and then make, make my way down the main access road into Boyatella Hi, Diana. Diana is wondering about the bit of moisture we've received overnight, and she says, "Is it going to make tracking more difficult uh, or easier?" Well, we didn't really. I think we probably didn't even get a millimeter, but it's it's sort of damp and it's definitely put the dust down. Uh, so I'm hoping we do find fresh tracks, but it will make tracking a little bit more difficult. Um, when it's really, really dry, the tracks are much easier to find. But sorry, ah, terrible, terrible lions. Okay, copy, thanks, Orbs. So they've came in, chased buffalo around, then the buffalo were very rude and they ran across our northern boundary. So the lions followed them there, so I'm going to actually change my route yet again. And I'm going to go see if we. Oh, 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 oh. what's that? You see that, Dave? I'm down the road in the distance. There's something, I saw something crossing. Oh, it's Impala. Darn it. <laughs> I just saw movement. Now, oh, that is, you can see how far away that is. That's really far away. Um, so it always pays to check those little half chances out in the bush. But I must say, I am really loving this weather this morning and hopefully the cats are still on the move. So we're going to keep checking down towards uh, Buffalo Sook Dam, that area. So they could have chased the buffalo up and down along, along our northern boundary. And uh, if we got nothing there, then we'll head south and see what we can find. Oh. Whoa. Hello. Um, not the best view, they are inside Buffalo Sook, but it's quite a big herd of wildebeest. I haven't seen a nice big herd of wildebeest for a while. Here's one of this year's babies. That's how quickly they've grown. Now this tiny little bit of moisture will cause a little bit of flush on certain of the grass species. Not much, but animals like wildebeest, zebra and all, all the other grazers are really going to take advantage. Gnu. So, of course, wildebeest are also called gnus, and they're called gnus from the sound they make. Gnu. 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 Now, it's quite funny. You can get wildebeest to snort quite easily. You just go... Are <laughs> <laughs> oh, you supposed to snort back, Vildi? Obviously, my wildebeest is a, is a bit out of practice. But a shame, we'll <laughs> leave them to carry on their, their grazing. And we're going to keep checking to see if we can find these lions. So while we head east uh, down the Buffalo's Hook cut line, uh, let's go find out how Ryan's endeavours are faring. Oh, 
Wow, Brent, uh, 50 birds in one morning. That's uh, quite ambitious on, on a winter's morning, but good luck. I hope you get to find them. It's not impossible. I'm sure you will manage quite well. So this morning we are going to head in a southerly direction. I think those lines have crossed over. So let's go look for some more exciting things. One thing I wanted to emphasize on this morning was survival techniques. And at half past eight to nine o'clock, we are going to be crossing over to St. Benedict's. And I'm sure those little eight to nine year olds would love to know how to survive in the bush. But I would like to know from you, if you were stuck in the bush and we said, here you go, you've got a backpack, what three things would you put in your backpack to survive? Please don't say a case of beer and a jet ski and all of those things. Just uh, simple survival tools. You've got water in the bush, you've got food in the bush, everything else is out here. You'd be surprised at how many things you can find to survive in the bush. Remember that humanity survived in the bush for thousands of years before we developed iPads and iPods and, and so forth. And here's Brent. Let's see what he has to say. I wonder how far he is on, on his bird list. The grey-headed bush rock is always a good one. One bird that I'm really, really trying to see and I've been looking for seven years for it is the gorgeous bush rock. Now that bird is incredible. In a few minutes I'll stop and just show you what it looks like. Morning Brent, morning Dave. How are we doing this morning? Oh, we're just going to take a drive around and uh, yeah, see what we can find. How's your bird list coming along? Oh. <laughs> A bit ambitious. Uh, well, we'll see. I think the most we've ever got is 35. So. Okay. Uh, it's worth the challenge. And we've got the super zoo. I'm going to terrorize Dave. Okay. Make him look for little things in trees all day. Well, good luck, friend. Cheers. Enjoy. Good luck. Danger, Dave. Enjoy. Good luck, Dave. So one's a good start. You have to start somewhere. Arts. Fuzzman Sparkles wants to know what my favorite bird is. Well, a very good morning, Fuzzman Sparkles. That's a very interesting uh, username, and uh, I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Birds are somewhat amazing. When I first started guiding, it was very difficult to get into birding, and a, a very, very wise mentor taught me that birding is something to move on past looking at the big game. And I don't have a particular favorite bird. I do like the bush sharks, all of them, the gorgeous bush shark, the gray-headed, the orange-breasted, even the crimson-breasted bush shark, which is found on the northwest of South Africa. Now, if we're looking for birds in particular, let me tell you a story first before I get into, into this. I had a gentleman on my vehicle. He was on 4,200 birds and he came to South Africa to look for another 50 bird species. So we managed to find him around 30 of those 50 that he was looking for. So it's a challenge, it's something that you're always looking for. And if you've got a bird list at home, keep it going. I know some of you are on over 230, so hopefully we can find you some more birds. My favorite bird, or the bird that I'm trying to look for the most, that I've spent probably the last 10 years looking for, is the African pitta. Now, the African pitta has been seen in South Africa once or twice. It's more towards the equator, so it's an equatorial bird found in the foresty areas. And I'm going to stop for a second and just show you what this beautiful bird looks like because you actually won't believe the coloration it's got on there. So I'm going to get my handy bird book out. Now, if you have a look over here at the bottom right, there's actually two of my favorite birds on the, on the page. You'll see in the bottom right the African pitta. It was called an Angola pitta. And on the left, the Narina trogon. Now, a lot of people come to South Africa just to look for the Narina trogon. It's got this beautiful iridescent green with this red pigmented sort of belly. And the African pitta's 
got similar colorations to it. Now, can you believe that bird is so difficult to find? If you look at the distribution over here, it's only been seen three or four times in South Africa and quite prominent over the Mozambique area and sort of north of Zimbabwe. What a pleasure. So when I find that bird, I'll be sure to let you know. And ahead of us is probably one of the most underrated creatures in the African bush, the impala. We're going to pull up to these impala and just have a look. Michael. Michael says uh, he would take some water, a knife, and all the African knowledge that he could possibly gain with the question that I asked earlier about what three things you would take in the bush. Well, Michael, knowledge is key to survival, I think. If you don't know what to eat or drink or how to get it, it's not going to be very helpful, is it? So a knife, very, very useful, and water we can find out here. So I would take, instead of water, perhaps something to boil some water, just to, just to make it pure and clean so we can drink it. Now having a look at this young male in parlor, you can see the hair on them is slightly puffed up. Have you ever got really, really cold? What happens to your skin? You get goosebumps, don't you? So you'll see the, the hair on this has expanded and that expansion allows the warmth to stay within the body area. It's quite a, it's quite a diverse herd here. There's males, females, youngsters. If we have a look at the, the females on the right there, Jandre. Jandre is just going to zoom in for us. See that popping through? A lot of these females will be pregnant right now. The rutting season happens around the first week of May, normally during the first full moon. And they're moving off quite nicely. Oh, Jandre, have a look on the right here, they're jumping across. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh. It's always the ones left at the back that have to hurry up and say, don't, don't go, wait for me, wait for me. We're going to leave these in parlor. They're heading into some thickets now. What's your favorite thing about an impala? I want to know. I think the, the fact that they are so diverse in terms of their feeding techniques, they can eat bush and grass, which allows them to survive in just about any ecosystem in South Africa. Now, in South Africa, we've got a very, very diverse ecosystem. The area that we're in at the moment is predominantly savanna. Now, savanna takes up one-third of South Africa's land area. And that's quite a large area, considering that uh, if you're from America, welcome. Uh, Texas, Texas is about the same size as South Africa. So if you've ever driven around Texas, you'll kind of get an idea. You can't just scoot down to Cape Town in a few hours. From here to Cape Town will take you probably about 18 to 20 hours to drive. So it is a huge, huge area, and we're in the far northeastern side, where savanna is very, very prominent. And impala love it, but they'll also live in a grassland area. I've seen them in Albany Thicket around the Eastern Cape. And perhaps if you had to put them in Fainbos area, in the, in the Cape areas, they could possibly survive, but uh, I don't think as well as what they do in, in, in the savanna. Right, let's carry on. Let's uh, try to pick up some, some tracks and see what we can find. Oh, I've dropped my microphone piece. I'm just going to chuck this into my pocket quickly. I hope you can also hear me in the, in the control room. So this morning on controls is Jerry. And uh, Jerry, I want to know from you 
What animal you want to see this morning, please? <clears throat> a lot of people come through to the bush in Africa thinking it's this dark, deep, dangerous place. But to be honest, animals are a lot more shy of us than we of them. So when we're driving around and we see a lion sleeping in the bushes, everybody's like, oh wow, isn't that going to get in the vehicle or is it going to attack you if you walk around it? Animals are naturally scared of humans. I have comms, thanks Jerry. Uh, just wanted to make sure my microphone piece fell out, so I just wanted to make sure everybody in the control room can still hear me, and they can. So, we'll come back to survival techniques shortly. In the meantime, Brent has got a second bird on his list that he wants to show you. Brent, what do you have over there? So, the lines have gone to the north, so we're going to concentrate on our birding challenge. There we go, number two, slightly, slightly damp magpie shrike. Perched hunting, looking for any insects about me moving about in this cool morning. You can hear quite a few other birds. I'm just trying to see where they are. There they are. And uh, we can't turn down any opportunity to get a get a get a get a species um, in that big tree at the back on the right. So you see it there? Yeah. There we go. Noisy virtual starlings. Also looking a little bedraggled this morning. There's a pair of them. So of course, my attention span is terrible. So you guys out there watching the live safari, you're going to have to keep the numbers list for me. Uh, otherwise, I think if we go, we go beyond three, I'll forget. So we're right at the edge of my limit of counting. Oh, but I do hear another bird. A noisy bird making lots of noise up ahead. And it's an arrow marked babbler. So let's see if we can find them. Now, trees like that over there, we're going to have to keep checking today because some of the jackalberries are fruiting already. So always a good spot to get a few species of birds. Now, where did those babblers go? Oh, there's one there. Yeah. Here we go. Number four. Oh, I can count beyond three. The arrow marked babbler. As you can see, they live in little flocks. There's quite a few of them hopping about there. Let's try to get a little bit closer to them. It is quite dark this morning. Oh, it's Dave. You got one there? Yeah, just around the edge. Oh, oh there you go. let me see. Let's try to get a bit closer. Now, they've taken my advice and gone straight to the big jackalberry tree. Oh, they're hopping about, but they're quite high up there. And as I said, it's a bit dark and morbid um, looking today, even though it is great birding weather. They love, birds love these cool misty mornings. And you can see there's a lot of preening going on at the moment, getting rid of the dampness from the night. Here we go. There we have marked babblers. Bird number four. Now, of course, we're not only looking for birds, we're looking for anything that might be out here. Uh, but if you do have any questions, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv. Ah, 
A very good morning to a very apt name. I walk in the rain would like to know how large or small is a lilac breasted roller. It's probably from uh, outside of your predatory birds and your, your water birds. Uh, we would say it's a, it's a medium to large sized bird. Probably about the size of a ruler with the tail 15 centimeters of a short ruler. And what have we there? Good morning, Cape Turtle Dove. Very puffed up, looking a little bit displeased with the weather. Now, they prefer nice, bright, shiny weather, the doves. They like to walk around on the ground. Oh, we can hear some Franklin calling, but unfortunately we can't see them. I'm sure we will see some later, though. Now, that's probably one of the most common bird species we get here in the Sabi Sands, the Cape Turtle Dove. Sorry, sorry about that. Dave had a bit of a bit of a camera mishap there as he was trying to zoom out. So if you feel like someone's been shaking your head, it's exactly what I feel like looking at my monitor. Okay. Hello, a sink lioness in Mississippi. Now, sink lioness is wondering about a bird I've never seen in this part of the world, uh, the crested crane. And she would like to know whether they're aggressive. Uh, only to other crested cranes, really, and only during um, the breeding season. They've got a very distinct call. I'll see if I can find it for you. I need to put the sound on because otherwise Siri tries to talk to me when I occasionally accidentally push the thing down. Okay, uh, crane, we want to see. And uh, crested cranes are actually, well, I think what we're actually referring to is a crowned crane, but I know they call them crested cranes in some parts of East Africa. There we go, a gray crowned crane. and. Very distinct call. Uh, where I went to boarding school, we used to actually have them quite often and hear them. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, but you can see their distribution. Uh, they don't really come where we are, just below us. They tend to stick to moister areas, so you can see the high rainfall zones and areas of a lot of water like the Okavango Delta and the Caprivi. There we go, the grey crowned crane. And there are two different types of crowned cranes in Africa. You get the grey crowned crane, which is in southern Africa. And then you get the northern crowned crane, which is of course further north. Oh, we can hear a Franklin going berserk. I can't see it though. Always pays to double check. Man, he's a bit far from the road for us today. Okay, let's carry on. Now, one of the really, really awesome Franklin species, the two of my favorites we get here is the, the Shelleys and, hello. Uh, the old lion tracks. Um, the Shelleys, I think this is where they came from last night. There's the whole pride walking down the road. Um, the Shelleys and the Koki Franklin. And in this very dry weather with not a lot of ground cover, they, they, two of the harder ones seeks. They like to skulk. And uh, I am hoping that we spot those, but I did spot something. Is unfortunately not something to add to our list, but since we're doing birds, it's quite interesting. Now, normally, you see it there, darling? You know, the nest. Now, I'm trying to see, normally around a little nest like that, there should be a paper wasp's nest. Um, it looks like a little 
uh, blue wax ball nest. And unfortunately, no one's at home. So they build their nests next to wasps. And it's one of their defense mechanisms. And I'm pretty sure maybe on the other side of that nest, there's a paper nest, a paper wasp's nest as well. Okay, so let me just have a quick look there. What tracks are those? There's a Howard, there's a hyena. So I just want to go to this little corner, see if there's anything here. This is the boundary between uh, Torchwood, Buffalo's Hook, and Juma. I'm quite, quite a busy zone from time to time when it comes to animal tracks, but it looks like it's been quiet over, overnight. So while we continue our endeavors to see what else we can find here in the African bush, uh, let's go see how Ryan's doing, and he's up to the west of me. Well, it sounds like Brent is doing a fantastic job of finding you those. Bird species. He's only got about 46 more to go. Not too bad. <laughs> with a two hours left, I suppose. <laughs> this morning, I want to show you something really interesting. I'm going to show you how, how ruminants digestive system works. But before we do that, uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to take my earpiece out. Please ask Jean-Dre and uh, Control Room will send that question through to Jean-Dre and ask me while I'm doing this. So I'm going to pull my earpiece out, so goodbye, and uh, let's uh, see what we have here. So a lot of the the areas you'll find are quite thick where we've come across this nice open sodic area and sodic areas are just a high density of salts and so things struggle to grow here although this isn't quite a proper sodic area it's sort of edging towards it and it's a really good place to find a elephant dung, giraffe, zebra, whatever else animals occur here so by the end of this show, I all want you to be qualified pooologists, and that's very important. If we have a look at this dung over here, and we bring it through to you, and we're actually going to get quite a few different pieces. For any of you those of those that actually like horse riding or have seen horses in the wild, this one's not so great, but you can kind of see where I'm going. It's sort of like a bean shape, and you can break it nicely in half, just like that. This is from a zebra. And you can see predominant grass inside there as they are bulk grazers. We can see it's not all that well digested. It breaks up pretty easily. And please don't worry about picking up any herbivore dung. Herbivore dung is quite all right to pick up. It's the carnivore dung that is not so great. It has a huge amount of bacteria and uh, you might get a little bit ill if you had to contaminate your lips or any food with it. So this is perfectly all right. Earlier on we saw the Impala running across the road and uh, there's quite a nice little midden going on here. Now a midden is an area that they do territorial marking with. So an Impala will come here over and over again and he will say basically, hey mate, this is my area, don't touch my females, or else I'm going to give you the boot. So if we have a look at some of this dung, and some of this is fairly fresh over here. You can see some are cylindrical, well they're all cylindrical I suppose. And this is quite fresh, and have a look at how fine this is over here. Now the reason for it being so fine is because they have adapted a special type of stomach to make sure that they absorb up to 60% of what they eat. Unlike elephants or rhino, 
that only absorb about 40% of what they eat. And yesterday, Taylor was showing you the Nyala and how they regurgitate. And I'm sure some of you saw that sort of peristalsis going up and down the throat. And, and that's how they take it from their main stomach, chew it again to make it finer and go back into the main stomach. And now I'm going to try to show you. And please excuse me, if you can't see this all that well, uh, jean Jay will let me know and we'll, we'll try something else later. I'll probably draw it for you. So now I need a stick. There we go, this one will do. <clears throat> jean Jay, how's this over here? Is that okay? How's that? Even closer. Even closer? Okay. So if we talk about the throat, the animal, excuse my drawing, so that's the head of the animal, that'll go down the esophagus. Now the esophagus has these wave-like movements that push the bolus or the food down in a wave-like movement, like I just said, <laughs> into a major stomach over here which is not the true stomach, called a rumen. Now, the rumen is like the engine of the stomach system. It'll go down, and all the pieces, the bigger pieces, will sit at the top here. At the bottom of the rumen, there's the thing called a reticulum. Now, the reticulum has this sort of sieve-like structure, and all the finer food that has been chewed properly will go and pass through this tiny little sieve-like structure. The top pieces will get regurgitated back up and chewed again until they're fine enough to pass through here. And then it goes into the intestine. And the intestine goes like this, I'm sure you all know that. And in the intestine there's two other stomachs called a reticulum and I've gone completely blank on the other one now. The and <laughs> the The reticulum is the true stomach of the animal, and so this is where most of the digestive sort of happenings will take place. And then it'll pass out, and it'll end up just like this over here. And we've got some wildebeest dung, some of it a little bit uh, clustered together like this. You can see they're a little bit more irregular than the impala, which is uh, broken apart. And of course all the bigger pieces there, and you can see quite a redness to those bigger pieces, would be elephant dung. So this also is a ruminant. Okay. Brent's found another bird. <laughs> I'm going to send you back to Brent. He's found us another bird. Hopefully it's a nice, exciting one. If it's, if it's a gorgeous bush rock, I'm going to be very, very disappointed. But uh, let's carry on and see what we can find. There we go. Not a gorgeous bush rock. I think all of us would be jumping for joy if we found a gorgeous bush rock in this part of the Sabi Sands. Uh, but there we go. It is a Batalea. So a member of the snake eagle family. And of all the birds, the raptors are going to, or the big raptors are really not going to be huge fans of this weather. And they are waiting for it to warm up so they can catch some of those warm thermals. And even like the little birds, they're doing a bit of preening, sorting out the feathers. They are exquisite birds, incredible eyesight as well. They are experts at finding carcasses. And they often spot them far before vultures. They do fly at a lower height than vultures. And uh, often vultures, if they see a battalier going to ground, they know there's something good there. Now it takes a battalier eight years to get that beautiful adult plumage. And for that eight years, they're quite dull brown looking birds. But... As soon as they reach adulthood, they definitely bloom into these incredibly wonderful creatures. All right, let's leave the battalier to its preening. We've got birds to find. I think we're on five. Well, the birds fly to us. And there we go. 
Uh, not the best view, let me just try and move around a bit. But it is a, you look like a yellow billed hornbill. Oh, there's another one. Up at the top. There we go. Not the best view, but one of our more common bird species and, and, and another one for the list. Come on, there we go. Show us, there we go, your yellow bill. And I've got a plan. I'm going to hit the, the birding hot spots of Juma. So we're going to start making our way through the crest area. So what I'm looking for in the crest here is I'm looking for a bird party. Now a bird party has often up to five or six species in it and they move around foraging together. And then hopefully we find a nice sort of bird party up here in the broad-leaved woodland of that Combretum zone. And after that, we're gonna make our way down towards the river systems and hope for some of the skulkers uh, that we might find in that area. Some robins, bush shrikes. Uh, but for now, let's explore the Combretum woodland. Now, Gary's asking us about a very rare bird. It's called a Taita falcon. And uh, there's only one place in South Africa that they occur, um, which is near Hutzpreet, up in the mountains. And it is one of the rarest birds in Southern Africa. Uh, the best place in Southern Africa to actually see them is around Victoria Falls in the gorge. Uh, they nest there, but as far as I know, there are only two nesting pairs in South Africa. And let me see, I know I have a picture of one here somewhere. That's it. Very, very, very beautiful. Uh, very rare in South Africa. And where is it? There we go, all that. Look at that. So, there we go. That's around Hutzbreit. Those are the three dots. There's only three nesting pairs known in the whole of South Africa. The rest of them, the Zambezi River actually forms the border of Zimbabwe. Uh, over there in Zambia and you can see around the mountain gorges and stuff there and up into the eastern highlands of Zimbabwe so they generally like mountains and they exclusively nest on cliffs so a very good place to see them is in uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe around Victoria Falls uh, I saw Taita Falcon in January uh, when I was at Victoria Falls we actually saw it from a white water raft. Okay, come on, bird party. Hi, Jen, or oh, Jen B. Uh, Jen says, if a bachelor takes eight years to become an adult, how long do they live for? Jen, they live for about 40 years. Uh, a very long lived bird. Just quickly check for any tracks. Now, it seems when I start birding, Karula pops out just to thwart my bird list. So, fingers crossed that she does that today. Oh, what's that down the road there? But we don't have any tracks yet. She's been a bit scarce uh, since I've been back. I thought I saw something. I did see something, but I think it's a bird we might already have on our list uh, and it is indeed the yellow-billed hornbill in that dead tree there and a better view so we will stop for a quick look also doing his morning preening oh but Dev behind the yellow-billed hornbill oh no don't fly away no come back where are you gonna land was an African grey hornbill. <laughs> yes. uh, I've been told by Final Control that that did not count. Okay, so let's just uh, try to find that African grey hornbill. Hopefully it hasn't flown off too far. Pretty sure it flew into, there he is. On the lower branch of that little marula tree there. Here we go, you can see a very different coloured bill from the red and yellow billed hornbill. And I think we might be lucky with the hornbill species, they're going to help us this morning. And we've got one more common hornbill to find, the red bills, which I'm quite confident we'll find. And unfortunately, all the bird parties 
seem to be in the, away from the roads at the moment. Ooh, I do hear some birds up ahead though. Little birds. Oh, I like little birds a lot. Okay. Now, this is where the cameramen start sweating in panic when I say little birds. They can be this big. Okay. Around here in these weeping wattles. Ooh. It sounds like we're coming up on a bird party. Let's go 20 meters forward. Got there. I can't really see at the moment. A little bit up there. there we go. Oh, that's a good one. I'm hoping it moves into a little bit area where we can see it slightly better. But I just got a brief glimpse of the face. There it is. And it's a very distinctive face. Now, oh, come on. Can you think forward or back? What do you think, Dave? back. Oh, it's going to move. But I'm actually going to let you guys ID this one. Sorry about all the, the, the... Oh, no. Wait, they're still there. There's a pair of them, actually. Oh, I don't think we're going to get a view. Anyway, there was enough to ID there. So, and I see a bird party up ahead. So there was enough to ID that. If you know what bird that was, it's going to be a bit tricky. Uh, but send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Okay, here we go. There's some birds up to the left. I can hear quite a lot calling as well. So we found uh, a bird party up in the sort of broadleafed woodland. We've got Aramark babblers, which we've already seen, but I'm just going to try... I saw another bird, where did it go? Let's just switch off for a second. You can hear there's a little bird party. They are a little bit far from the road. Mm, they're playing tricks with me. They're just a little bit too far, even for the super zoom. But we will keep up with our endeavor. I'm hoping to find a bird party that surrounds us. Now, there's a couple of species we're looking for, uh, especially in this, this area. And uh, it's going to be uh, the scimitables, uh, your wood hoopoos, and uh, southern black tits, crombecks, uh, maybe, maybe if we're lucky in a palace, so there are lots of species to look for in this area. But quite often, as I said, they move in bird parties. So you go through quite large gaps without those little birds all frolicking about. So we're going to keep searching for birds and anything else that might be out here. So while always, we're just going to get one in the bank quickly before we go back to Ryan. And it is one of our more common species. Got him there, Dave. There we go. Oh, no, there's another one out in the open to the... Oh, there's two. Okay, wait. Come out. Uh, so you see the fork-tailed drongo, yep. go to the branch, um, the main stem of that tree. Go down, and I'll zoom, center frame. There you go. <laughs> blue wax ball. Little blue wax ball. And of course the fork-tailed drongo as well. And I think the wax ball is going to be a harder one to get than the fork-tailed drongo. Oh, off it goes. So, oh. <laughs> While we keep searching for other little creatures, 
uh, of the feathered variety. Uh, let's go see how Ryan's exploration of Juma is going. Well, a very good morning. If you've just joined us, Brent is in search of some birds. He has got 50 to find this morning. He's on 11 at this stage. If you have any questions, remember to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send any of your queries to questions at <laughs> wildearth.tv. So I just went a bit blank there. Sorry, I'm trying to uh, multitask here. Men are not very good at multitasking, so please excuse me. I'm trying to look for something exciting. Jennifer still wants us to find baby elephants, which will hopefully happen this morning. I'm not quite sure. And we are going to carry on driving around in search of anything exciting. So, if you have anything you'd like to see, let us know. Now, Brent, I've got a challenge for you. I would like to see a ground hornbill. You've seen some yellow-billed hornbills as well as grey hornbills. So, a ground hornbill is a very rare species to see. And there are not a lot left in the world, unfortunately. One of the reasons being is that they don't breed. <laughs> they don't breed very well. They only have one to two tricks every seven to nine years. And if any of you've ever seen a ground hornbill, it's a lot bigger than its distant cousins, the yellow-billed, red-billed, or grey hornbill. It stands about this sort of high, and it's got this extremely long beak with this massive red pouch in the bottom. And in Shanghai we call it a... Just one second, I thought I heard something there. What was that? I don't know what that was. I thought I heard something a little bit different, but uh, carrying on. Now, talking about a ground hornbill in, Sh in Shangan, they call it an Inga Tutu, which means after its call, it goes tu -tu 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 and that's made with that massive sort of pouch under its sack. Now, let me show you what it actually looks like quickly. Some of you are probably guessing what this fascinating bird is. We generally find them in groups of five to six. Um, reason being is that there's an alpha female and an alpha male that do the breeding, and then they have about three or four males that help look after the young. Now, these males will stick with them for the rest of their life and allow the alpha male and female to breed every seven to nine years. The females will move off and they'll go and try to find their own little sort of clutch of, of hornbills. But you can see this massive red uh, pouch over here that they used to make that sound. And the female's got a bit of blue under her pouch, which is not nearly as big as the males, and that's because the males do all the vocalizing. Typical ground hornbill gets its name because it's always on the ground looking for snakes, beetles, it'll even eat carrion from a carcass. So they are very, very diverse creatures. And this typically be, would be a good area to find them. They do prefer open areas, but uh, being savannah, you can find them almost anywhere. Now I'm just trying to see if there's any tracks crossing over here. Not much happening here. There's an old lion track, relatively old, and some old buffalo tracks, but nothing too, too fresh that we can follow up on. Now Arcadia is asking what classifies this area as savannah? 
Oh, Katie, a very good morning to you. It's great to have you on our show. Oh, Katie, it's it's all done under types of, I'd say, um, ways that the bush grow. So, for instance, this is a mixture between trees and grass, where something like grassland would just be completely grassland with one or two trees. Something like forests would be huge, massive forests, very thick undergrowth. Something like Albany Thicket, which is found off the east coast, would be densely, densely populated. Uh, things like speck worm. So certain species of trees also class make it sort of into its classification. Desert, I'm sure you're pretty aware of what that is. Fainbos type of smaller, robust, woody plants. And then if you go into the Karoo, you get Nama Karoo and Succulent Karoo, and that comes after its name, Succulents. So that's what classifies savannah, is a different type of species, as well as a mixture between trees and grass. I hope that answers your question. So while we carry on looking for some tracks and that elephant for Jennifer, I'm going to hand you over to Brent as he's got a little bird party and hopefully he can lift the species numbers up. Okay, so we are around, surrounded by birds at the moment. They are Okay, there we go, okay. Through there, beyond our favorite tree. Um, let me just go forward slightly. No, no, actually just there. Come out a bit. Oh my God, a little bit higher. Oh dear, no, I think I can see it, but you can't. Let's just go forward. So I can also hear a woodpecker around here. Um, I've heard a scimitar bull. Uh, so there's quite a lot of stuff around. Gonna just stop here, we can listen for a second. There we go. There we go. That's one of the b specific birds we've been looking for in this area. The southern black tit. Whoop, off it pops. Now there's quite a few other birds. We just have to be a little bit patient and wait for them to show themselves to us. Have you got something? Oh, what have you got in the background there? Oh, it's the southern black tit. I can hear a little crombeck. Did it? Oh, at least we got the southern black tit out of this bird party. Now, that, that was one of the specifics we... Oh, there we go. Okay, on the ground. There, in that little bush, something flew there. A little bit up, I think. Oh, you got, you got it? Oh, there we go. Dave's found something frolicking around in the base there. Come on, pop your head up. I think I know what it is. Right, let's just wait for a slightly better view. Looks like a little rattling cysticula. Well, we can't be sure yet because he's hiding in the base. Come on, pop up. Well, a really, really great answer from Bridget in Johannesburg. Uh, it was a very difficult bird, that bird quiz. It was a Karachani thrush. And it is quite, that is a very difficult bird. And that little rattling cysticula is not playing along, but I'm quite sure we'll find another one at some stage. So I'm just gonna move forward. Oh, Dave's got something. Oh, there we go. Well done, Dave. White helmet shrike. Oh, there he goes. Well, not the best view we've ever had of one, but definitely one for the list. Let me see if we go forward or back. Oh. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> Murphy's Law. Now, they also very commonly members of these bird parties. So, I think there's quite a lot of action going on just beyond. I'm just going to move forward slightly and see if we spot any movement. Mm. OK, 
Okay, we're going to keep moving on. I think that bird party's moved a little bit further off. Hi, I think a lioness um, would like to know, um, have I ever seen a pygmy falcon and what are they like? Well, isn't that quite a good question since I'm still on the falcons on my my book, or oh, I suppose it's not a book, it's a, it's a digital version of the book. I'm trying to find one for you now. Oh dear. A pygmy falcon, and what are they like? They're very, very cool little birds, uh, but they generally live in the arid parts of South Africa. There we go. <laughs> and they are about 20 centimeters long. They're very, very small. And that's the pygmy falcon. And you'll see here now, shortly, there we go. So they live in the desert areas of northern South Africa and into Namibia. So I've seen them in the Kalahari National Park, which is in that dark green section, and that's one of their favorite areas. And they actually are quite common in the arid area. But uh, outside, as you can see where we are, no pygmy falcons, unfortunately. Um, we have seen, oh, there's a lion. Don't know, I just just caught the end of something. It sounded like it could be a lion, but very far away. Ah, there's a there's a, a one for the list. That's a nice easy one to get. Um, through between those two trees right at the top of the marula hopping around. The grey go away bird. I'm just listening. Sorry, to see if we can hear another bird party up ahead. The birds are really vocal this morning. I'm going to give the, the broadleafed woodland a bit of a, a break. Maybe we'll come back. We'll definitely come back through it at some stage. Uh, but we're going to now head down towards the Mawati River system and see if we can get some robins uh, or other creatures like that, that that like the thickets around little riverbeds. Uh, so there's a couple of birds that we, we really just want to get through because we're going to see them and it'll give us a chance to, to focus on the harder bird species to find. Okay, let's... I haven't done this road in a very long time. So Michael's wondering about owl species and how many species we get in the Sabi sand and which is my favorite. Uh, well, Michael, let me just think. We get Varroas. Uh, oh, the Varroas, spotted eagle there. Our records of Cape Eagle Owl, but they're very rare. Um, there's even records of Pearl's Fishing Owl, but they're very rare. We won't get them up here. It'll be around the rivers. Um, there's Bard Owlet, Scops Owlet, Pearl Spotted Owlet. And white face scops owl, I think that's all of them. So seven. Uh, my favorite is the white faced scops owl. Uh, they're really, really, really pretty to look at. And I can hear some birds making noise. And ah, it's magpie shrikes. We've, we've seen those already. Let me just see if I can find the owl for you. So, I don't know, I just find the, the white-faced owls very, very cool to look at. Uh, they're quite small. Where's that bird? I can hear you, Roller. Oh, where are you hiding? Sorry, I've been sidetracked by a Roller calling. Oh, there it goes. Just behind the tree. <laughs> Well, at least we keep the cameraman working hard when we do birds. Let's just go forward a little bit, see if we can get a better view. You see him, Dave? I can hear him. Making lots of noise. Got it. 
There's got him. Here we go. Lilac breasted roller. Beautiful bird with that not so beautiful voice. Uh, one of the two resident species of roller we get here. The other one, of course, is the purple Rufus crowned. And uh, we do have a nesting pair of them on quarantine, so we might have to take a meander past there later. Okay, well, let's leave the roller. We're going to continue on our birding endeavor. Uh, I'm not sure how many species. What do you think we are now? About 15, I reckon, somewhere around there. Uh, so it's still quite, quite a bit of work to do. So while we try to find some other feathered creatures, uh, let's go see how Ryan's getting along. Well, getting back to survival techniques, we are looking at a really interesting tree that is probably going to give you something quite nice in the morning. It's called a weeping bourbon or a Scotia brachypotata. Now, the Scotia is uh, very well known for its huge beans that it produces. Now, any of you coffee fans out there, this is something that you could use to survive in the early morning just to get you up and about like uh, most people do I think. So what the, the old settlers used to do, talking back now to the 1820s, is they used to take the beans from this uh, weeping bourbon and just like you'd make coffee they would roast them and then grind them and make a coffee. Now I don't think it took off too well as uh, nobody uh, would be in their right mind to go to the shop and ask for a weeping bourbon coffee, so please don't do that. Um, we have survival techniques out here, and there are certain little joys that we find in certain trees. Now, if you look to your left at this tamburti over here, this tamburti is also very useful. Don't ever burn or make a fire with this wood. It's got a high toxin rate with a chemical called rotenin in it and this is very very bad. It will make you extremely ill if you use this for firewood. But if you have a toothache you could take the sap and drip it on that nerve ending which would get rid of a toothache which I'm sure uh, none of us would want when we lost in the bush. So very very importantly we need to find and use this knowledge uh, to survive out here. This is the Tamburti. The Bushmen, in fact, used to use this on their spearheads as a poison. And uh, what made the Bushmen such good trackers was they used to put this on their spearhead, stalk up to the creature, and it would take quite a few days for the poison to actually kick in. And they would follow these animals for miles and miles and miles until the animal eventually fell down from exhaustion and from the poison from this Tamburti tree. So if you find yourself in a position where you can uh, sort of build yourself a bow and arrow and if you're good enough to stalk an antelope, well, good luck. That's all I have to say. It's easier just to go down to the local butchery, I think. So we're going to carry on. So earlier I asked what three things you'd take with you to survive out here in the African bush. And Maggie M, a very good morning to you Maggie, from Australia, I hope it's not too cold uh, down that side of the world, but uh, a Swiss army knife, a great idea, that thing can do so many things for you, a ball of string and a first aid kit, well that is most certainly useful if you're looking to survive in the African bush. Now later on at 8.30 we have St. Benedict's joining us from Johannesburg and I'm actually going to teach you how to make some string or rope with a certain tree out here and it's almost as good as you'd buy it at the DIY store in your local town and uh, many more survival techniques to come as we're driving around the Dujuma concession in the Sabi Sands uh, which is part of the Greater Kruger National Park. 
my earpiece has just come loose. So I'm going to put that back in. Otherwise, uh, Jerry won't be able to talk to me. It's fascinating how we can just drive around. And I know we haven't seen a lot of antelope species this morning, but that's the beauty of it. If we had to see everything on a daily basis, how boring would this place be? It would just be like a zoo. And we are far from a zoo. We have to drive around for ages looking for these creatures this morning, which is perfectly fine. Some mornings you might drive for the first 10 minutes and see everything. So we don't want that every morning. We want to stay excited, entertained, and uh, of course intrigued by these animal species. Brett's doing extremely well. He's uh, over 14 species now of birds. Oh, look here, look here, look here. Have a look at this amazing little creature. Now this is something quite unique to see. It's a young male steenbok that is just walking around. You can see he's a little bit wet from the early morning rains. But what's unique about it is he's so relaxed. Normally they, because they're solitary creatures, they can sometimes be a little bit more shy and anxious than say a herd of impala. You can see his little spear horns. Now the steenbok, it is one of the smallest antelopes in our area, or it actually is the smallest antelope in our area. And it's a young, <laughs> it looks like a young male, but it's actually fully grown. I wonder where the female is. Now, these are monogamous creatures. So a male and female will stay together or pair together for life. And often within an area like this, you'll find the females not too far away. Something fascinating about these creatures, they're very specific feeders. Now, I'm going to ask you a question quickly. If an impala weighs roughly 50 to, well, let's talk about the females, 30 to 40 kgs as a female, and a steenbok female weighs between 6 and 12 kgs, an impala's gestation is about 6.5 to 7 months. What do you think the gestation of a steenbok is? Now think about it, they're solitary, they eat specific types of vegetation, so is it longer or is it shorter than that of an impala? Let's drive around the corner, let's see if we can find the female, and you'll actually notice the female is somewhat bigger than the male, and that should give you a little hint to the question that I'm asking you. Let's look carefully. They're so well camouflaged. The, the word steenbok, it comes from buckstein, which means brick, like those old school red bricks that people used to build the municipality buildings with. Sorry, I have to see something a little lighter than normal. It could just be a little termite mound. I'm going to have a look with my bins here quickly. Can you see that there? No, it's it's actually just a just a leaf. It almost looks like the the rear end of some small cat. Carl, I'm glad you enjoyed that steenbok sighting. Animal sightings are incredible. Something as small as a steenbok, which you don't get to see every day, is quite nice to spend some time with. And that's the beauty about my job. There's no rush. There's nobody saying. I need to be here or there at any single time. We're just driving around enjoying what we do. So, Carl, I'm glad you enjoyed uh, looking at that steenbok. I can't seem to find this female. She could be in the vicinity. So earlier I said, what is the gestation of a steenbok? And you're not allowed to Google it either. That's just cheating. And uh, Dave says four months. Dave, it is a little bit longer than four months. It's almost six to six and a half months. And why I say six to six and a half months is purely because depending on the area that they're in will determine certain species gestation. 
So why do you think it is long or that same gestation is a, of an impala? Now, one of the reasons being is that because they're solitary creatures, oh, fantastic, sorry. Ah, oh, there we go. Dave, I'll get back to you on that question. Have a look in the distance there. Just want to go a little bit forward. How's that for you, Chandra? Jennifer, look what we have here. We have just found an Ellie. And it is a spectacular sighting with the sun piercing through this thin cloud and it has even started to rain. In South Africa we call this a monkey's wedding. I'm not quite sure why they call it a monkey's wedding. Hopefully uh, I'll be able to answer that for you a little bit later. Let's head around and see what this Ellie is up to. It looks like an elephant bull, not a baby but still an elephant. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna hand you over to Brent shortly, see what his bird list is looking like. It has started to rain a bit, so we just have to cover our cameras up and uh, take it from there. So we are going to just prepare Brent for a uh, link through and see what he's got. I wonder if he's got the hornbill that we're looking for. I hope so. Uh, any of you want to see a ground hornbill? Stick with Brent. So I've just heard Brent has got a signal problem. So we're just going to stop for a second while we put our rain covers on. Jandre is going to do that in a brief second while he does that. I'm going to have a look at this beautiful vista that we're having a look at. So Brent is back online. I'm going to hand you over to Brent and see what birdie's got for you. Look at this. Not the bird I was expecting to find down in the Milwaukee River, but a lovely bird nonetheless. Quite a difficult one to ID at the moment, just the way it's looking, but I'll tell you what it is. It's a juvenile African hawk eagle. So it hasn't got that striking black and white colors of the adult yet. And you can see the feathers are starting to change color. Now, would you be kind enough to turn around and face us, mister? Now, African hawk eagles are great hunters of other birds. Two of their favorites to eat are Franklin and Guinea fowl. And you can see, but like a lot of the birds we've seen this morning, a bit bedraggled, preening, trying to get some of that moisture out of their feathers. Beautiful. Almost looks like it's thinking about flying off. Uh, this is bird number 16. There's still lots of work to do, but we're in the right area to do it. Oh, I hear a robin. Oh! <laughs> oh! Fluff, 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 fluff. Oh, are you going to fly, mister? Now, if he does fly, you'll hear all the other birds have a panic. As I said, they're great hunters of birds. Oh, off he goes. Listen, listen. Wah, wah. All the great go away birds panicking. Okay, um, I can hear a robin calling just up ahead, and I'm hoping. Sounded like sounded like it was calling around here.
Sorry about that. It seems like there's just a little bit of signal issues down there. Oh dear, a big tree. Dead tree has fallen over the normal path out of here. We're gonna have to go round. But I can hear a lot of birds in this area, so I'm quite excited to have an explore around here. So normally we wouldn't be driving through the bush like this, but the problem is the tree has fallen over the road. <coughs> whole flock of, what's it look like? It looks like green pigeons. African green pigeons. And I can hear that robin calling just around where those pigeons are. No, I think we'll get a bit closer to them. Let me just get around this bush. Oh, I'm in a bush. Green pigeons are actually gorgeous, gorgeous birds. The colours are incredible, and I can hear that white-throated robin calling. So let's have a look here. How's that, Dave? Are we a bit too underneath? So here we go. Can you also hear a black-eyed bulbul? There we go. Hello, green pigeon. Now, if we have a look at their feet, it's very, very interesting. They've got, oh, we can't really see, you just see his toes sticking out there. They've got very interesting feet. They've got zygodactyl feet. Which enables them to clamber around in fruit trees. And look at that. Isn't that just the most beautiful of all the doves and pigeon species? The African green pigeon. Such a clear eye, and they've got a slight hook on their on their on their bill for ripping open fruit. So their fruit is their main source of food. Now I'm sure once these guys dry out and thaw out, they're going to be heading. There's a jackalberry tree that's not too far from here that's fruiting at the moment. Now I'm just going to move forward a little bit to see if we can catch a few of the other species calling below them. right on the edge of the Moati River and listen to the bird calls around us. Very, very pretty. So we're just going to stand by here for a little bit and uh, hopefully if we patient, some of those robins and other skulking species will show themselves to us. So while we do that, Ryan's got a great big grey pachyderm to show you. Well, earlier we were just getting the covers over the cameras as it started to rain a little bit, which is quite unusual for this time of the year. And we've come across this really nice sized herd of elephants. At first I just thought it was one, but it seems to be quite a lot. Look at that. What a beautiful morning. Bit of rain, sunlight, and some elephants. We're going to take a drive around and see if we can get a little bit closer for you and spend some time with these large African mammals for a little bit. Remember if you have any questions, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv. Let us know what you think about these magnificent creatures. Earlier, while Jandre was putting on the camera cover, one of the females was screaming really, really loudly. And for me, that was not a nice sound. It could be a young bull causing trouble with a little calf, 
So Jennifer, you want to see a baby elephant. I think we might have one for you. And I'm just going to stop, ah, oh, just quickly, while Brent is looking. Brent, do you know what bird this is over here? I've got a little Senegal lapwing for Brent to add to his list. Typical ground bird. You can see that short little beak used for catching little insects and vertebrates. Well, Brent, you're going to have to come find this yourself, mate. We are looking at elephants right now, and I can see a few baby elephants, which I'm super excited about. I just want to be careful over here that I'm not going too close to eggs. Um, you can see they're not really moving. So what we're going to do is just loop around. We have to be quite conservative when driving close to birds like this. Now, lap wings are very well known for displaying when you get too close to their eggs and even elephants will be chased off by lapwings coming down and mobbing them. I've seen it quite a few times. It is quite a nice size herd. I can see at least 10 to 15 of them. Now herd sizes vary, you might see a mega herd containing over 100 to 150 elephants, that's normally quite a few smaller herds all grouped together. We're going to try to go down into this valley. Okay, do you think we should go back? Mary Ann, I couldn't agree with your comment more. Mary Ann saying that any day with Ellie's is a better day than any. And uh, I couldn't agree. This is very exciting. And uh, we're going to head around to an old track that Jamie's just pointing out. Try to get a little bit closer. I'm trying not to drive over any of the elephant dung. It's a very, very good food source for things like dung beetles, and other insects, termites, so if you drive over it, of course you're going to end that life of a, a certain little creature that we don't want to do. Essentially we are conservationists and we will always be. So Aubrey wants to know why elephants push down trees over roads and leave certain branches uneaten. Now Aubrey, it's a very good question. Elephants sometimes go for certain trees. They'll push over trees like these terminalia on our right to get to the root system, not necessarily the leaves, because the leaves are quite high in tannins. So it kind of makes it difficult for them to eat the leaves and the roots might taste a little bit different. So, you know, they might seem destructive and a lot of people say they are, but the truth is without elephants, we actually wouldn't have such a nice balance between bush and, and animals because the elephants open a lot of pathways for other creatures. So as we're going down here, this is an old hyena track. Um, Let's see what we can find. Aubrey, it doesn't seem like any Ellie's have pushed over trees here on our road, thank goodness. But you can see all the way around us how they've pushed over some trees. And just a quick one, and just to show you how this actually works. So you'll see this little bush willow on our right here, how it's been pushed over. But look how many trees are growing from this pushed over bush willow. So the roots are still intact. And from one tree being pushed over, you've got now more than 10 other trees growing from it. So the question is, are elephants actually that destructive? I'd say no. i say they all serve a purpose.
so I do have people on the back with me, so I just need to concentrate and make sure we're all safe, as well as the animals being comfortable with our presence. So just watch out for the branches here, guys. Are we all good there? Here we go. It's a marvelous herd. There we have it. I don't want to drive any, over any of this baboon's tail. It's a very slow growing plant, but have a look on our left hand side here. It's not a very small baby, but Jennifer, that is the baby you were looking for. Elephants are pretty much all the way 180 degrees in front of us. It's nice just to sit and listen and appreciate these massive creatures in our presence. You'll see this young little calf here, it's probably about four or five years old. It must be starting to uh, get weaned off from its mom's milk, which would be around four or five years old. And in that fourth year, she should fall pregnant again, which uh, she's got a gestation of over 22, well, around 22 months, depending on which area of Africa you look at. At the moment, we can just see buns. Look at these two. Looks like two young bulls sniffing out each other. They might put on a little show for us. You can see the one on the left, his ears are flared out. But uh, it's more playful fighting than anything serious. The young bulls, it always actually reminds me of an Italian family. Anybody in Italy, you'll watch and know what I'm talking about. But they always bully around each other and play with each other in quite a sort of aggressive way. But as soon as something comes in that disturbs the whole herd, they stick together. And that's quite unique about elephants. They have no time for any predator interaction. They stick together and they'll chase whatever's sort of prowling them quite fast away. a younger one. He's probably on three, four years old. This one, you can see his tusks are coming through. Now, Brent and uh, Steph, we're talking about tusk, tusk development. And some, some elephants don't develop tusks at all. Some develop them when they're really young. Some start only late. It all depends on their gene pool that they're in. So the genes depict how big an elephant's tusks are. You cannot tell an elephant's age by the size of the tusks. We've got this beautiful light coming through now. So Aubrey, earlier you were asking about elephants pushing over trees. Now you'll notice that they eat a little bit then they move on. That's also an adaption that they've developed but also what the plant does, the more it eats, the more tannins are released and the more bitter the leaf becomes. So elephants will eat to a certain point where it doesn't taste so great anymore and then move to the next plant.
pretty well spread out. There's a couple on the left, about five or six on our sort of immediate right, and about 15 to 20 ahead of us. See, she's got quite nice tusks on her. Well, a very good morning to all the children at St. Benedict's this morning and Miss Barnett. It's a pleasure having you here on Safari Live. We've just found a herd of elephants. And for all the eight and nine year olds, please send in your questions to hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. And I want to know from you what you think of Ellie's and who in the class has uh, elephant as their favorite animal. So we're going to be looking around here and uh, st we're going to stick with them for a few few minutes and uh, see what they get up to. We're not in any rush to move off from these elephant herds and uh, later on I've got some useful tips for all the little children at St. Benedict's on how to survive in the African bush. So in the meantime let's enjoy these elephants and have some fun. So the herd that we've come across is a nice breeding herd of elephants. I'm sure you've all seen uh, them on TV, or I'm sure some of you have been lucky enough to go into the Kruger National Park, which we are a part of, and uh, witness these fantastic large mammals. Now I want to know from you, how much does an elephant weigh? A big elephant bull, what do you think its actual weight is? Right, while we're looking at these amazing creatures, I'm going to hand you over to Brent, who is looking for birds this morning. He should be on about 20 by now, I hope so. He's looking for 50 bird species, which is a very ambitious thing for this morning since we've had a bit of rain and uh, the birds are out and about. So good luck, and uh, Brent, what do you have to say? Well, welcome to Miss Burnett's class in St. Benedict's Grade Threes. And there we have a female brown hooded old oh, kingfisher, and off she goes. So, we're looking for birds this morning, and I think we're, we, we, we're not on 20 yet. It's a bit embarrassing, but uh, hopefully we'll get there. Uh, but a big welcome to you guys, and hopefully we don't only see birds. I know you've seen some elephants already uh, with Ryan, and maybe we'll find a big cat or two. So, we're going to keep checking. Uh, around Juma. We're in the Sabi Sands Game Reserve uh, in South Africa, as you know, and uh, we are sort of right next to the Kruger National Park, for those of you who know Kruger, but there's no fence between the Kruger and us, and the animals are able to come between the two, and it is a misty morning. We had a little bit of rain last night, so as Ryan said, the birds are loving life today, and I hope you guys are as well. Uh, this is a nice way to, I wish I got to do this when I was at school, rather than actually having classes. But uh, we're going to take you on an adventure around the game reserve. And please, guys, ask me questions if you want to know anything. Uh, you can ask me or Ryan, and we'll do our best to answer them for you. Now, St. Benedict's, where you guys are at school, my cousins actually went to school there. So I do know your school, and also one of my first teachers I ever had uh, was from St. Benedict. So I had a very interesting junior school life and I lived in the bush and we had a teacher who lived with us and she was from St. Benedict's before she came to teach my brother and I. We used to have a classroom in the bottom of the garden in the middle of the bush. So we used to start school at five o'clock in the morning and finish by 9.30. Well, 
Good morning, Matt. Uh, Matt is wondering what my favorite. Matt, that's a really difficult question. I've got lots of favorites. Uh, but I would say one of my favorites in this area hmm, uh, would have to be the African hawk eagle. So it's a beautiful big black and white eagle. And I'll show you a picture quickly. So, doom, and that's not it there. Where we go? Whoops. Uh, there we go. That's my favorite bird in this area, the African hawk eagle. Very, very beautiful bird. But we're going to see what else we can find on this beautiful winter's morning out in the bush. And while we do that, I know Ryan can't wait to show you those wonderful elephants. So I'm super excited that you're back with us and we are watching this four five year old four five year old elephant busy moving around and looking for some food to eat. You can see how he uses his foot to look and dig for things to eat. Now elephants they can consume quite a lot of food on a daily basis. So everybody, Luke from St. Benedict's wants to know how much does a baby elephant weigh when it's born? Well, Luke, let me tell you that these creatures are very, very sort of heavy boned and they can weigh over 100 kilograms when they're born. Now I want to know from you what other creature, which is a very tall creature, weighs over 100 kgs when it's born. And all the people, how many muscles do you think are in that trunk? There are between 60,000 and 100,000 muscles in that trunk. That is a lot. I'm actually not sure what tree that is. Jamie, do you have any idea what tree that is with those berries? Do you know what it is? It's a young jackalberry. By the looks of its leaf structure. I could be mistaken though, but jackalberries do fruit this time of the year. Hence the name. Jackals will eat the fruits during the dry months when it's harder to catch uh, any smaller little insects or rodents. I just want to give you an idea of how big this herd is and uh, Jandre will just uh, zoom out and just show the viewers and all the kids this morning how many elephants there actually are. So Matt wants to know why all the elephants are so close together and rubbing against each other. Well Matt, they have this relationship just like you do with your folks and they would love to build their relationship so they're often rubbing against each other and showing each other love basically and that's how they build their relationship. They're a very very close community and elephants don't tolerate lots of trouble from any other animals. So a lot of people say that the lions are the kings of the jungle. To, to be honest, I think the, the, the elephants are. So Gareth, you want to know how well an elephant can hear the hearing is pretty good, but not nearly as good as what their smelling is. And so their smelling is probably the strongest out of all their senses. I'd say they can probably hear about the same as what we do, which is pretty poor in the animal kingdom.
So while we sit with these elephants and enjoy them, I'm going to hand you over to Brent. He's got a little surprise for you with some tiny little creatures. Welcome back, guys. Look at this. This is a dwarf mongoose. Oh, off they go. And they're busy foraging at the moment. So they're looking for all sorts of little creatures to eat, uh, bugs and uh, even scorpions and spiders. Oh, that one looks like he got something there. Now watch how they dig into the ground and they'll dig out all sorts of different little creatures. Uh, one of the coolest little animals out in the bush and it's the smallest carnivore in Africa. So out of the mammal carnivores, like meat eaters, it is the smallest of them. And they live in family groups, sometimes up to about 30 in a group. And we're very lucky because they're very used to us in the vehicle, so we're able to watch them feed and dig and scurry about. Look at them all jumping around, digging up. I want to see if this one, oh, he's digging a big hole there. Maybe he's found something. Nope, nothing in that hole. Now, being so small, they get eaten by lots of different things and by big birds, like that hawk eagle in the picture I showed you. So while the others are looking for food and running around like that one, there's always one somewhere who's keeping a watch. And so he's keeping an eye on the sky and making sure that nothing's going to catch one of his family members. Uh, hi, Tate. Uh, Tate would like to know, what is the most intelligent animal in the Sabi Sands Game Reserve? Now, that is a very good question, Tate. Um, I would say it would have, probably have to be baboons or hyenas, I'd say, are the two most intelligent. Now, hyenas are very clever, so I've heard a woodpecker, but it looks like it's flown away. And so I'd say baboons and hyenas, uh, vervet monkeys as well. Monkeys or primates are quite intelligent. They've got very good cognition skills, uh, but then so are hyenas. Hyenas can be very, very smart. And they, they learn very, very quickly. Hi, your viewer. If you would like to know how, how long I've been a ranger, oh, a very long time. Um, I've been in the bush since I was about 18 years old, and how old am I now? 33. So, how, old, how many years is that, Dave? My, my maths is in very... 15 years, there we go. I've been a ranger for 15 years. Sure, I'm getting old. But it is an amazing job, and who knows, maybe we've got one or two rangers uh, sitting at St. Benedict's who one day might join me out in the bush. So you'll see I've got a radio here and that lets me talk to all the other game drive cars. So see if there's any lions or leopards or other animals around. Hi Zachary. Uh, Zachary likes to know how fast can that mongoose run? Well it can run very fast for a short distance. So how they get away from predators is they have what we call bolt holes. So little holes in the side of uh, termite mounds or hold, holes in the ground. If they feel threatened, they go right down into the hole to get away from them. So they can run very fast, probably around... Let me think. Maybe they can get as fast as about 50 kilometers an hour, but for very short distances. So about as fast as Usain Bolt over a short distance. Sorry, I was just listening to the Game Drive channel there. I'm looking for leopard tracks, I'm looking for all sorts of things. And no, nothing there. So, hi Matt. Matt would like to know what is the rarest animal in the Sabi Sands. So, out of the big animals, it's probably the African wild dog. They are an endangered species. But uh, probably to see the rarest animal in the Sabi Sands is uh, an art wolf, so part of the hyena family, but he doesn't eat meat, he eats termites. 
That's uh, the last one I've heard seen in the Sabi Sands was in 1970. So uh, not very common. I have seen them elsewhere, but in the Sabi Sands, an art wolf is probably the rarest of the of the mammals. But now I'm going to keep seeing if I can find a big cat for you guys. While we do that, let's go back to Ryan and the Ellies. Right, welcome back everyone. We are with these thick skinned animals, also known as pachyderms. So, in your next test, I hope you get that right. Now, these elephants are slowly moving in a northeasterly direction away from us, and unfortunately, because we quite conservative and we try not to drive off-road too much, we're going to leave them in the next few minutes and then I'm going to show you something very exciting about how to survive out here in the African bush. Now these would be some creatures that you'd come across. Tanyani, good morning to you. Well, you want to know how much a female elephant can weigh, and that all depends on where they are situated. Now, a big, big elephant bull can weigh about 5 tons, so that's about 5,000 kilograms, where females are a little bit smaller, anywhere from 3,500 to 4,000 kgs. But as we get closer to the equator, they get smaller. The reason being is because there's a lot more food closer to the equator, so they don't need as much fat reserves. They are huge creatures, aren't they? Now, Deacon wants to know how old an elephant can get. Deacon, they can live up to around 65 years of age. So very similar to that of a human. It's quite old, isn't it? I would say. Now we're going to have one last look at these elephants and then I want to show you some cool tricks to survive in the bush. And to all our other viewers joining us, welcome to Safari Live. We have got St. Benedict's from Johannesburg in South Africa watching during school hours. So to educate the little guys between 8 years and 9 years old, we are very, very excited. Let's see how Brent is doing with those birds. I hope he's past 20 and uh, I'm sure he's going to get that ground horn wolf for me. If he doesn't, I'm sure he's going to make me a nice cup of tea or hot chocolate when we get back to camp. Brent, how's things going there? So uh, I would really love to find the ground horn wolf. We are in a good area for them, but we also moved into an area that a female leopard lives in and her name is Shadow. So we actually get to know all the different animals out here really, really well because we're out every single day looking for them. So at the moment we're looking for a female called Shadow and she's got a little baby at the moment who's about four or five months old. So hopefully we have some leopard luck. Good morning and Nahum. Nahum would like to know, can a honey badger defend itself against a lion? It most certainly can. Uh, a lion can kill a honey badger, but they generally prefer not to fight with them. They're incredibly tough little animals. Now, they've got multiple defense mechanisms. So they've got a very loose skin, so it's very difficult for an animal to actually bite through to their, their muscles or their bones, because they can almost turn around in their skin. And another uh, quite disgusting defense mechanism is they can spray a very foul smelling secretion from uh, their anal gland and they like a skunk. So a lot of the, the sort of smaller little carnivores like that, so polecats, um, honey badgers, civet, are all able to spray a foul smelling uh, concoction onto anything that tries to hurt them. So they can most definitely. I've actually seen a honey badger chase a lion before.
Hi, Luke. Uh, Luke wants to know how much meat can a lion or does a lion need to eat in a week? Well, Luke, they are able to eat up to sort of about 12 kilograms to 15 kilograms of big male in a single sitting. But on average, um, over a month, let's say, well, per day, because um, they don't eat every day, they only eat when they catch something. But on average, it's probably about seven kilograms a day. So seven times seven is 49. So about 40, 50 kgs of meat a week. And uh, that's not to be full, that's just to survive. Come on, Shadow, where are you hiding? Hi, Zachary. Zachary would like to know, do I live in the bush all the time or do I have a normal home? Well, Zachary, I live in the bush here at work all the time. And then my home is in a different bush. <laughs> so I do, we do have a home, but it is all still in the bush. I really love living in the bush. Uh, I struggle in Joburg. Too many cars, too many people. Uh, you can see how busy my traffic is on a Tuesday morning. Uh, it's the way I like it. My traffic jams are elephants and lions and buffaloes. Uh, but speaking of tusked animals, uh, Ryan's got another animal who's got nice tusks to show you. After seeing some of the biggest, well, the biggest animal on land, we have come to another grey animal with some extremely big tusks. I haven't seen a warthog with tusks like this in ages. Look at how they're curling around and look at that shaggy hair on the back. This is a very, very big sow. And we are very excited to see what they're going to get up to. You can see they're busy grazing and these pigs will eat the whole day. Now, you'll see this one in particular is on her sort of knees and this just allows her to not be so stressed around the neck muscle area so she'll almost do a leopard crawl and eat it's just basically being lazy I suppose now have any of you actually wondered why they are called warthogs now if you have a look at that one on its face well let's just see what happens here there we go. Can you see just below the eye there? There's this almost protruding type thing below its eye and on the front of its nose. It looks like big growths. And people have nicknamed those warts. In fact, it's this cartilage. So, Ms. Bennett, I hope you can tell your students what cartilage is because I'm just uh, not quite sure at this stage how to explain it all that well. But this protrusion helps the males protect their eyes when they're fighting. So those big tusks don't get into any contact with the eye. And it's a beautiful morning here again. It's quite overcast. Nice and overcast today. And uh, these pigs will be enjoying this sort of temperature. It's about 61 degrees Fahrenheit about 18 degrees Celsius which is not too bad it's a beautiful morning have a look at that one that's on her knees at the moment can you see how she's got that white beard protruding from the side of her face now that is supposed to mimic tusks so just like we saw that big one with the big tusks so when a predator sees this it looks or thinks twice before going for it because it thinks oh look at the size of those weapons I better be careful and there you can see that beard on the side looks exactly like the tusks next to it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you got to go, you got to go. Bush toilet. Uh, we've all got to do it. They've just got the pleasure of doing it while they're walking. So Brent has some birds doing a territorial display, and he really wants to show you how exciting this is. Brent, let's see what you've got there. Well, we've got some really cool birds here. They're called a green wood hoopoos, and they're busy having their morning meeting. Now, I'm hoping they're going to show show you what I mean. Oh, where they go? Are they going to do it again? They're very, very noisy when they in the early morning like this when they get going, and they make a lot and lot of sort of 
that's sort of what they sound like. But of course, Murphy's Law, uh, they've gone quiet now, but they've got really cool beaks and they're sort of like a sword, like a hooked sword. Oop, pop down. Oh, there we go, that one's feeding now. And you can see that beak there. And that's to go into deep holes in the, in the bark to find different little hohos. And they can also fit under the bark and they can bring out larvae of different beetles. And of course they are not making lots of noise now. So hopefully they call again. Okay, well, it doesn't look like they want to do their show for us anymore. So we're going to keep looking for leopards and birds. So we're in the dry season, and that means there's not a lot of water around. So I'm going to head towards a water hole, and maybe we'll have some luck around there. So while we do that, let's go see what Ryan's up to. So he's still with his little creatures, pig type family, the warthogs. There's another very rare type of pig that we get here, the bush pig. Alonzo wants to know, are they related to pigs? In fact, they are. They're part of the Suidae family, which are pig family. You can see he's also going about doing his morning business. You have to go, you have to go. So Zachary wants to know how fast a warthog can run. Well, Zachary, that all depends on what's chasing it, I suppose. The faster you're getting chased, the faster you're going to run. I'm not exactly sure in kilometers an hour how fast they can run. I'd say easily 50, 60 kilometers if they're really trying to get away from something. But they also maneuver, so they do this. And they'll always go down a warthog hole if there's one close by. Warthogs burrow under the ground, and that's a safe area for them, where lions and leopards struggle to go into. It's, a, it's quite a fast creature. Nobody in their right mind will chase a warthog. They're also very, very dangerous. If you have a look on the side of their face, they've got these beautiful tusks, and we saw that beautiful male earlier. And Deacon wants to know what they actually use these tusks for. That male just behind that fallen over tree. There you go. Deacon, they're used for a number of things, for digging out roots, bulbs, and also for digging their burrows. So they'll actually use it to scrape the side of the sand where they burrow down, and if we come across a warthog hole, I'll try and see if we can actually point out those tusk mask, marks. But also, they use them for self-defense. So if they're being chased by something, and I've seen it on a few occasions where a cheetah is chasing a warthog, and this cheetah, in fact, chased this warthog under our vehicle, and this warthog came running out and uh, tried to grab the cheetah or hit the cheetah with it, and the cheetah just said, no, I give up, thank you very much, you're too strong for me, and moved off. So very, very good tools for self-defense. Now when we talk about animals in the wild and intelligence, it's, it's somewhat a controversial topic because how do we know how clever animals are? And Gareth wants to know how clever warthogs are. I'm sure they have very, very good instincts where they know exactly what to do and when to do it. Now, to say whether they're clever or not, it's not for me to say, unfortunately. But uh, seeing that they're all adults, I think they're pretty clever in their own right. Let's just drive around.
Tyler wants to know how much a warthog weighs. A big male that we're looking at right now can be 40 to 50 kgs. The female is a little bit smaller, 20 to 30 kgs. So Joel wants to know how you can tell the difference between a male and a female. Have a look at this one here. Now if you look at the side of his eyes there, Joel, he's got those warts that I was telling you about. So he's got two sets of warts, where the female's only got one set of warts. And also, of course, the obvious behind the animal. And also just look at the size of their tusks and the actual size of him compared to the females. He's so much bigger. Oh, he's a beautiful boy. I haven't seen a warthog like this in ages. That is very, very mature. So I don't know if any of the boys like any of the girls there, but you'll see that he's trying to impress them and say, hey, how are you doing? I'm sure you'll buy a chocolate for lunch later and uh, see how it goes. The smelling of, of a warthog is very good. They also have quite good eyesight. But look how short they are. So when you see a warthog running away into the thick bush, you'll see the long tail at the back. They're standing up like a radio remote control car. Now this is to help them follow each other. Can you imagine trying to run through the bush at only a foot in height? You'd really struggle to see above the grass. and their tail swishing from side to side, trying to get rid of any flies that might be bothering them. So, Matt wants to know, good morning Matt. I hope you're behaving in class this morning. How long do warthogs live for? Well Matt, I would say a good female or good male may live between 10 and 15 years old. So it all depends on what the environment is like. It is crossing over the front of us there, and they're quite happy eating away at this grass. Well, Alonzo wants to know also how long can a warthog's tusks grow? Well, Alonzo, how long is a piece of string? So, that all depends on the genes that it has. A warthog with very good genes might have longer tusks. Someone with not so good genes, a little bit shorter. And some of them also break them. Once they've broken it, that's the end of the tusk. It doesn't grow back, so it's exactly like your teeth. So you have to make sure that you look after your teeth every day. Make sure they're brushed morning and evening, please. That's very important. And uh, I'll make sure that the warthogs brush their teeth. <laughs> oh, Tate, this is a question of my morning, my friend. <laughs> what noise does a warthog make? Now, I'm not even going to try and mimic it. Um, it is similar to that of a pig, like... <laughs> It's, uh, you see, that was quite shocking, wasn't it? So, I want all of you in class to show your teacher what noise a warthog makes. So, on three, are you ready? One, two, three. How did it go? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Everybody, I'm going to say goodbye. I hope you've had a fantastic morning with us. Brent is waiting for you with something exciting, I hope, and we'll see you tomorrow. So we've come across a nice herd of elephants. And there we go. You can see that little one there using his trunk to pick the leaves off a little leadwood tree. Now, 
Can you believe that there are over a hundred thousand muscles in an elephant's trunk? And it's like an elephant's hand, and they're very, very good at using it to pick up things. Uh, let's just go forward a little bit. Hello. It's okay. Oh, I can hear them talking. So elephants can talk to each other. They use very low rumbles. Some of them we can't even hear. And if any of you guys have ever watched any movies like Jurassic Park, uh, all the dinosaur noises are actually different elephant noises that are slowed down or sped up uh, to create that sound effect for a dinosaur. Now, elephants, a female like the one we're watching here next to us, can eat up to 150 kilograms of food in a day. But it's been great having St. Benedict's Grade 3 with us on this live safari. And uh, we're going to say goodbye to you now, but don't forget, you can join us anytime you want. Just ask your teacher. So you don't even have to be at school to come on a live game drive. So from myself and Dangerous Dave, my cameraman, it's been great having you, and hopefully we'll see you soon. So here we are, we're still with these Ellie's lovely little herd. But they are starting to move into <clears throat> some very thick area. Right on the edge of the Marikeni little river system. Very close to where the Inkahumas caught a buffalo not so long ago. And as you can see, most of them in front of us there are just disappearing into those thickets. I think our bird mission this morning, is we might come a little bit short, but we can always continue to try to get 50 species in a day. Probably a little bit more realistic. Here's a little one next to its mom. I'm going to leave the Ellie's to continue on their morning feeding, and we're going to see what else we can find. Now, there have been no tracks of any leopard, and the only lion tracks went into Buffalo's Hook. So, it's been a little bit quiet on the cat front this morning. Ooh, here comes a nice young bull. So he's going to walk straight at us. Dave, do you want to do a VR with this guy? Here he comes. Oh, he's got a swagger on him. Hopefully he comes close to the car. That's a young boy. He's got a bit shy all of a sudden. Oh, here he comes. Oh dear, he doesn't look too healthy. It looks like he's got a growth on his stomach. I'll we'll wait for him to come closer. Dave, I think push record. Cam's down. Cam's down, okay. Oh dear, look at that. We'll see now as he comes a bit closer, but I can't really see properly, but it does look like he might have a, a growth on his stomach, but he doesn't look unhealthy. He looks in quite good condition. And I'm actually completely wrong. It's just a really funny looking female. Oh, this is very confusing. It's a very big female and she's got a very bull shaped head, but I can see her mammary glands. Uh, just, I apologize, I was completely incorrect there. It's not a bull, it's a very big cow. Quite an old car by the looks of things as well. Hello, madam. But 
she still looks like and she's got a growth it would make a bit more sense if it's a really old individual yeah she's got a big growth on her tummy she's going to walk next to us so we'll see it as she there, there it is Sure, I've never seen a growth that size on an elephant before, and especially not in that uh, on on the on her belly there. Just maybe try and move forward slightly. So there we go. You can see that growth. It doesn't look like it's hampering her too much. It also looks like maybe it's a hernia. She's, she doesn't look uncomfortable, it doesn't look like it's, as I said, hurting at all, but it, it definitely might become a problem, especially, she's quite an old individual, and as she gets older, so there we go, shame, poor girl, I'm going to leave her, she's going to go join the rest of that herd, isn't that fascinating, that's not something you see every day, and we have seen, been seeing lots and lots of elephants in, in, the, in the last while due to the drought. And uh, we are seeing some quite interesting sort of individuals. I mean, we've got the elephant with the half ear. Um, and then we've got a couple of those half trunk elephants. And this is definitely the first elephant I've seen with it. It almost looks uh, like, a, like, a, like a hernia, but it, it might not be a hernia. Oh, uh, now the elephants are blocking my way. Uh, where am I going to go? Let's go this way. And of course, uh, an, a firm favourite with a lot of people who we discovered recently is young Benjamin Button, the little Ellie Bull who looks older before his time. Marianne, and yes, Marianne, as I was saying, it does look like a hernia, but it might not be. It might be a, a solid growth, but I think it could be a hernia, uh, which is very interesting. I don't think I've ever seen a hernia in an elephant before. Might have. I've seen a lot of elephants over the years. I'm just trying to remember now. I've only ever seen a growth or similar to that, but a long time ago in Botswana. Very interesting. Hi, uh, Justin. Justin's wondering what animals are related to elephants? Do any of them occur in Africa? Uh, well, the closest relative to an elephant that lives in Africa is a, a dussy or a hyrax. It's a tiny little fluff ball that looks a bit like a rodent. And that's actually the closest uh, living relative in Africa to, to the elephant. So uh, do yourself a favor, have a look uh, online. Look up a rock hyrax, H. Y R A X, a hyrax, and uh, they're, they're tiny little things. They're about the size of a, a small dog, um, and those are the closest living relatives to, to elephants. Very, very fascinating. Now, the one thing that they have, main, main thing that they have in common with elephants is they do have a common ancestor, but many um, over a million years ago. But uh, they have their, both of them have their testes on the inside of their bodies, which is an uncommon occurrence uh, in, in mammals. Oh, it seems to be getting colder. I took my jacket off. I'm going to have to put it back on. No sign of shadow on Arethusa. So I'm going to go check back up towards the gate and then maybe check around in Parlor Plains Nest. I haven't heard any updates about Tingana either. 
And I think it's time to go look for some more birds. So while we go see if we can find some feathered friends, let's go see what Ryan's up to. If any of you have ever been to the bush, you'll find that in your first experience, it's very difficult to try and identify certain trees. There are hundreds of different species around South Africa, or thousands in fact. The low felt is unique with the woody trees, just like this apple leaf. Now it gets its name apple leaf from the way it sounds when you crunch the leaf. It sounds like you're biting into an apple. The Latin name for this tree is Phalaenoptera violacea. Now I'm not trying to sound clever with giving you the Latin names, but all of these Latin names do in fact have meanings. Phalaenoptera is after the explorer and violacea is after the violet colored flower that this tree produces at the end of summer. Now in Zambia, the locals there make rafts or what we call a makoro out of this tree. This tree is still a little bit small but the bark is very very tough but also quite flexible. So that's one of the survival techniques if you find yourself in a water area and you've got a lot of time on your hands uh, try to get your hands on one of these trees and you can make a beautiful makoro or raft to get where you need to go and that's probably somewhere where civilization occurs. Now what you're going to do is we're going to head a little bit down this road to Terminalia, Terminalia Alley and Terminalia Alley is just the right place for me to show you how to make rope. So let's head down and see how you can make rope in the bush without actually bringing it with you. Well, Dee, all the way from Texas, has a great question for me. She has asked, how did I learn to become a ranger and why am I doing this? Well, Dee, to be honest, when I left school, I didn't know really what I wanted to do. And I was very fortunate, fortunate to be brought up in a coastal town. And my father was a passionate bush goer. And he took us all the way into Shalui and into the Drakensberg when we grew up. And after school we sat down and said, what do you want to do with, with your life? And I said to him, well, I wouldn't mind going to go work in a game reserve. At that stage, 11 years ago, believe it or not, um, I didn't know you could take people around on safaris. I thought the game ranger was just somebody that just walked around in the bush and, I don't know, drove around and fixed fences. And we found this course online and uh, they offered a year course. So I went to this beautiful place close to the Botswana border and I studied for a year and in our studies we talk about everything. There's 17 different modules that we cover and you can imagine birds, trees, insects, astronomy, the list goes on and on, conservation, botany, taxonomy, you name it. So it's been a great adventure and I'm still learning everything to this day. Um, I've learned so much in the last few days that I've been with the Safari Live team, they are brilliant and uh, we'll never stop learning and I don't think I'll ever stop doing what I do because this is, what a pleasure, get to go out here, I don't even know what day of the week it is, I think it might be a Tuesday and uh, people are out there working and uh, we out here doing what we love. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to find a terminalia or a silver cluster leaf that's quite a young one to make this rope with. Um, how's that one there? No. Okay, we're kind of looking, there's quite a lot of bush willows around here. I'm trying to find a terminator. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to take my earpiece out now. And for the next few minutes, I'm going to show you how to make some rope. So you can't do this with any tree. You have to find a tree that's got quite a fibrous bark structure. So something that you can pull off and stays together, not something that just peels off and breaks. So I'm going to walk around the back here 
and uh, I find this terminalia over here and we don't do this all the time just because we're doing a survival technique I want to show you exactly how we do it. So we're going to break it at the base here and you can see how it pulls off so easily look at that oh fantastic okay so unless you really need to do this, I don't recommend you do this to all trees, especially now that we're trying to, of course, protect everything. But this one's small, and I'm sure elef elephants will do the same thing. Now the trouble is, there we go, is trying to pull it off. Is that right for you there, Jandre? Okay, so you see, I've already got something quite strong. Now what we do is, we pull this apart. Okay, I'm going to make quite a thick rope today. But you can make it thinner, you can make it as thin as you like, really. And uh, in the old days, the Shangans, they used to make a cattle whip. You know those big ones that go And that's how they used to herd the cattle. So what we're going to do now, let's just take a little piece here. You can actually see, I'm going to string through quite a few pieces. There you go, Jamie, you can have some fun there. Thank you now what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually turn my back towards you and show you how to make this rope. So we take the end and we twist it. So you have that little twist to it. I don't know why I'm so out of breath. Maybe I'm nervous because we're going to pull this at the end and see if it breaks or not. Okay, so we've got a little twist. It's quite untidy. I'm going to do this one as well. Now that doesn't really look like the DIY rope that I was telling you about earlier, does it? Okay, and we're going to put those two together. All you need is two pieces and we're going to twist out and come over and twist out and come over and we're going to carry on doing this for a while until we've got a nice plaited piece of rope now I don't know if there's any sailors watching but uh, you'll notice that if you are on any ships the mooring lines look very similar to this that they, that they put the, the boats against the docks with and uh, one beautiful thing about this can you have a beautiful bird, a Koki Franklin calling right now. And you can kind of see where, where I'm going with this whole thing. How does that look? Hey, it's flexible. You can add a bit of water to this every day. We had a guest that had one on their wrist. So a guy that I work with made this. And uh, five years later, the guest returned and said, he had never taken an offer and still stayed on him. Jamie, how's yours looking? Beautiful. <laughs> it does take it, it does take quite a bit of practice, and your hands can get a little bit sore. Um, there we go. I think that's enough just to show you. You'll get an idea of how it looks. You can see. Is very very tough and very flexible, just like a rope you'd buy in a DIY store. So that is from the silver cluster leaf, and uh, it's not really looking all that silver right now. But uh, you'll find that in the summertime, it's got this beautiful silver shimmer to it, and all the leaves cluster together. Hence the name silver cluster leaf. Right, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump back in the vehicle. We're going to carry on. I'm going to hand you over to Brent to find some more birds on this beautiful birding morning. There we go. A starling. We've seen birchels. This is a Cape Glossy feeding in some elephant dung. They are exquisite. I mean, even without golden sunlight, you can see the really striking colors of the glossy starlings. You can hear them as well. Not the prettiest. What have you spotted? Oh, this is still the starling. That's a Birchall starling. Uh, the other starling species. And you can see a black face and dark eye, which is very different from the Cape Glossy. He's got that brilliantly orange eye. And I'm hoping there's quite a few different birds here. And the next bird actually happened to do it disappearing at. But we're going to keep going. There's some elephants in the distance. Uh, still inside Buffel's hook. I was trying to see if they were going to come towards us. It doesn't look like it.
Hollows, uh, you are probably quite correct. We've given ourselves a, a really difficult task uh, and not much time to do. And we've got 32 bird species to find, and that one flew away, so it doesn't count. <laughs> um, but I think, I think we can definitely go to, to half. Definitely get 25, maybe even 30. But then I think we're definitely going to have to try and get 50 birds in a drive soon. Let's have a look if we've got any bird species. There's one running. Get it, Dave. Quickly, he's moving, hey, Dave. There's another one running. Oh, there we go. Here we go. And female Natal Franklin. There we go, that's one, one, one less bird to find. Oh, two less birds to find, right next to me. The red bald hornbill, we haven't seen one of those yet. Giving his beak a little bit of a clean. Oh, we're gonna have to move off the road and cause a traffic jam. And we've, there's quite a few really common birds we haven't managed to get this morning, so I'm hoping that we can get a few of those out of the way. Let's just try to get out of the way of the car here. Very nice. It's going off the road for us. Morning, morning. Good, thanks. I see a very cool bird, one we don't see too often. It's a big bird as well. Oh, it's behind a stick. Let me just try reposition. Oh, I think, I think, I think it is what I think it is. Let's have a quick. Should it be good from, how's that? Perfect. Down next to Sydney's waterhole. It is a yellow-billed stork. Definitely not a bird we see too often. And there was a fish jumping in front of it. And that's of course what they like to eat, so with the lack of water we have around, we don't see them too often. Hey, very cool. Tom, turn, turn your head. I want to see your yellow bow. Now, while we wait for him to turn his head, Dave, I'm just going to ask you to do a perusal around the edge of the waterhole. Maybe there's an Egyptian goose somewhere around. Let's... Oh, dear. No geese today. Has he turned his head for us yet? No. Nope. You can see the catfish rising. And no Egyptian geese, unfortunately. There we go, there we go. Oh. <laughs> and some serious preening. They're actually very pretty birds. And you'll see why it's called the yellow wood stalk when it eventually turns his head slightly for us. Now keeping a lookout for other birds. Well, there we go. Come on. No. <laughs> Not being. Oh, there we go. You can see just see the yellow bill there now. Not the best view of the yellow bill. Oh, well, we'll leave the yellow bill stalk to its preening and see what other birds we can find. Now, I was hoping for some lap wings or anything out in the open here, but unfortunately, nada. Hi, Anita. Anita's wondering, do we get black eagles in our area? Uh, we don't, not in this part of the Sabi Sands. Uh, black eagles like mountainous areas or rocky cliffs. So nest in and we don't have any of that close 
so unfortunately we don't. Uh, so for those of you who are not sure uh, what a black eagle is, there's another name that it's called by, it's called a Verose eagle as well. Come on Dave, are your burning eyes on? Okay, good. Now all our regulars, there are no lap wings here today. Oh dear, playing hard to guess it seems. Should be a bird in this area. Dave, you've chased them all the way. Yes, didn't shower this morning, he says. Starlings, 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 we've seen the starlings. Linz and Drew in Johannesburg say, can I find them a button quail? I have not seen a button quail on a Juma and, oh, oh no, don't worry, we've seen them. <laughs> um, the only place we might find them, and it's only when there's a lot of grass, might be down on cheetah plains. Uh, so it, it, there's always a possibility, but they, they, they prefer sort of grassy areas, and uh, the best way to actually see them is to flush them. But there's always a possibility we might find one. Feel the panic setting in. I can't find all the birds. Uh, X Ranger says uh, he'd be really impressed if we uh, saw uh, the big bird out here. Well, we could organise. We could get uh, Aramark Babblers. We could dress Chandra up as big bird. That could be quite fun. Make him run across quarantine. Oh, I hear some birds up ahead. Let's see if we can find them. Looks like we've got a little bird party up ahead on the corner. A bit far away. We're going to keep searching for, for birds uh, while we do that. Let's go see how Ryan is doing. So, I'm sure by the end of this program, you're all going to be qualified pooologists. And looking at this poo that you've got right now, something that we're not going to touch with the hands but you can see it's pretty white in color now this is typically from a hyena as it eats a lot of bones and all the calcium and magnesium showing out through what you can see right there now there is a specific creature that will eat this hyena dung to act as a vitamin or a mineral the tortoise will eat hyena dung almost on a daily basis uh, to try and strengthen its shell if it can come across it. Now earlier on I showed you how to make some rope so Jamie has actually made a little bangle for herself and uh, we're gonna have a look. Isn't it beautiful? And, uh, I think Jerry's gonna give me four out of ten. So she thinks she's gonna get four out of ten from, <laughs> from Jerry. It's not as good as the one Herbert made me the one day. Jerry says you might get five and a half out of ten. Oh, Jerry. But uh, thank you for the ten out of ten everybody. <laughs> And one last survival technique before we end this beautiful morning is uh, something that's quite important, especially in the hot African sun. Now I'm going to ask Jamie to volunteer for me and jump down. I'm and uh, I don't think uh, she's going to look like she did when she started this drive. So I'm just going to unplug my earpiece here. And uh, I'm going to get a little bit of water, what I have left. And we're going to try to find a little bit of mud. Now, in the bush, if you don't have any sunscreen, an important <laughs> thing to do is protect your skin, especially on a hot day. Today is not too bad. It's nice and overcast. It's a little bit of rain, which we are thankful for. So we're going to take a little bit of uh, water, and we're going to mix it with this mud. 
and uh, we're going to get a nice little bit of mud going. It is quite sandy soil and uh, okay. Jamie, this is a good uh, treatment. We actually charge no fee for this at all. It is completely on the house and um, we are going to just uh, smear that all over her <laughs> like this and uh, as you can see she's, she's quite happy about this. Um, I was planning a trip to the spa. I don't have to now. <laughs> they charge thousands for this. This is uh, free of charge. Thank you. And there we go. That's Beautiful uh, sunscreen used on a daily basis. Don't forget to exfoliate everybody. I've had a great morning with all of you and fantastic time. So please join us this afternoon on Safari Live. Oh dear, it flew away! <laughs> oh, now, seriously, seriously, giving me a hard time. It didn't fly too far, I'm hoping. Oh, there it is. Um, no, can we see it? That is a question. Oh no, we can't see it. Uh, let's go forward again. Uh, no! <laughs> it's a horn ball. Oh, you got something in the distance. It's a starting. <laughs> Good try there. I'm really hoping we... Oh, look at that coming in there. You can actually see the rain coming in, in the distance there. Oh yeah, it actually looks a little quite heavy that rain. So I think Dangerous and Dave and myself have been discussing, we are going for 50 birds this afternoon. I think we can do it. I think we, we, were, we're, not, we were not far off today. Uh, but unfortunately they seem to be flying away. We're on 23, so nearly, nearly halfway there, and we've got four minutes to make it to 25, and at least that's half of our very, very ambitious goal. Come on, birds. So we're gonna drive faster. This is a bit of a dead zone at the moment. I wanna get through to another bird party. Hopefully we whack a few extra species, or two. We need two to get to 25. Spot a bird, spot a bird, spot a bird, spot a bird. Oh, not a raindrop. <laughs> that was a big one, landed on my forehead there. Okay, Dave and I, our heads are literally on swivels at the moment. Trying to spot any form of feathered friend. I think Lioness, she would like to know about nightjars. Uh, do we get them in South Africa? We certainly do. We get quite a few different species here. We get freckled, fiery necked, and uh, Mozambique or square tailed are the most common. But we're not going to see them very often during the day. We might see some on the sunset safari. So you're going to have to stay tuned this evening to see a nightjar. And this rain has just suddenly come out of, well, it hasn't come out of nowhere, but. I think it's the rain that might have found Ryan earlier because we this is the first raindrop we've had all day. 24! Emerald spotted wood dove. It, oh, Dave can't find it. I've lost sight of it now. Oh, but there's a bird party. I've got it. There we go, emerald spotted wood dove. Hello. That little one. And there's a chin spot battus on the other side of the tree, so I'm just going to... Where's he going? I saw him hopping about. You can hear him calling. Come on, there he is, there he is. You got him. There we go, 25. 
Chin spot batters. <laughs> Here we go. I don't know if you've heard Dave's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In the background there. Oh, off he goes. Uh, we, made, we made 25 with one minute, 10 seconds to go. So I'm pretty sure uh, we can get 50. Mm, it's going to be harder on the sunset safari. The mornings are always better for the birds, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a good challenge to have, and we're going to keep at it till we get 50. And once we get 50, then we're going to have to try for something even more than that. And that's going to be extremely difficult during the winter months. Of course, in the summer, when all the migratory birds are around, it makes life a little bit easier. And uh, here comes the damp. So it's not raining very hard, but it's enough to sort of cool it, cool it down quite a bit. I don't think it's going to rain for very long, so I think we should have uh, a good sunset safari. And uh, please join us in a few short hours uh, while Dave and I continue the bird challenge that we've set ourselves and uh, hopefully you'll join us for that bird challenge but from a wet and rainy Juma have a wonderful rest of your day and we will see you in a little while.